Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar for September 22nd. Tonight's conversation revolves around robotic navigational bronchoscopy, incorporating new technology into a thoracic oncology program. It is a pleasure to share this platform tonight with two experienced physicians who have uh, really leveraged this technology at their facilities to bring better care to their patients. Tonight, we're going to hear from Vru Patel, who is the Director of Bronchoscopy at Ascension St. Vincent's Hospital in Indianapolis. And we're going to hear from Matthew Bott, who is the Surgical Director of Endobronchial Therapies at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. They bring different and unique perspectives to this topic, and we look forward to uh, their conversation. I'm gonna share some slides with you as we get kickoff going. Uh, tonight's discussion about this novel technology is really essential in all of our practices. You can see from the graphic on the left of the screen that for the longest time, as we look to diagnose early lung cancer, we thought the game was in the middle. We thought it was central. And the technology available to us, whether it was light uh, bronchoscopy or autofluorescence bronchoscopy was all about diagnosing early lung cancers accessible by the existing technology. But as we know, the game has changed. The battle is now being waged in the periphery. And as the scan on the right side of the graphic shows, more and more we are faced with indeterminate or undiagnosed pulmonary nodules, sometimes as small as five millimeters, uh, which we have to deal with. And that's where tonight's technology becomes very valuable. So as we go through the evening, we're gonna talk about many things. The first is how are we going to help make earlier diagnosis of patients with lung cancer? Second is how do we incorporate this novel technology of navigational bronchoscopy into our practices of thoracic oncology? And third, how do we begin to recognize what this technology really means in terms of its presence within your comprehensive oncology program? It isn't true that this is not just about lung cancer. We're going to hear all about that this evening. The <clears throat> ION is a great opportunity for us to learn how to navigate to the periphery, how to make the diagnosis of malignant and benign disease, and how to incorporate this into our other treatment modalities, including surgical resection and perhaps a single episode of anesthesia. As we go through the evening, you're going to hear many things, and I want us to have an interactive discussion. Please hold your thoughts for the end, put them into the question and answer, and we will have a long question and answer session with plenty of time for you to have your concerns and uh, interests addressed. Please use the question and answer rather than the chat function, since that will allow us to more directly address your questions. So let's start off now with uh, Dr. Patel. And thank you all for joining us. Very appreciative for this opportunity to kind of discuss how I kind of incorporated uh, robotic bronchoscopy in my building, building my uh, thoracic oncology program so far here at St. Vincent uh, Indianapolis. So kind of uh, briefly to kind of describe what I'm going to be talking about, kind of brief overview of the technologies. We have two different types of robots out there currently um, using ION that Dr. Ross mentioned, which I'm a user of as well, and using the Monarch um, robotic bronchoscopy platform is the other one out there. And kind of talk about how we're using robotic technology to build our thoracic program and kind of impact with my thoracic surgery at my hospital itself. So briefly, robotic bronchoscopy, uh, there's two different types available in the United States so far. So the ion articulating catheter uh, that Dr. Ross kind of briefly mentioned a little bit um, and versus the Oris uh, Monarch uh, with this scope and scope model uh, being the outer sheath and the inner um, bronchoscope itself. So kind of briefly, advancements in navigational bronchoscopy. Uh, many of you may be familiar with SuperD system and the Varan system, we're using electromagnetic navigation and the Monarch by Aura's kind of uses a similar technology as well. And ION by Intuitive 
uh, in 2019 when it was FDA approved, came out with shape sensing, which is completely different from electromagnetic navigation. So when we think of robotic bronchoscopy and navigational bronchoscopy, you know, there's two different technologies out there. Uh, electromagnetic navigation being one and shape sensing kind of being the other one. And there's subtle, well, there's vast differences between the two because it's very different because uh, we heard a lot of misconception that when people think of navigation of bronchoscopy, that everything is the same, but there's um, differences, which I'll kind of go over a little bit. So the Oris Monarch, like I uh, mentioned, uses electromagnetic navigation uh, as its background for navigation itself. It is a scope in scope model using an bigger outer sheath, which is around six millimeters in size with the inner bronchoscope as well. And you control it with a remote control. Uh, the sheath can be locked in and you can advance the bronchoscope out into the airways and you are able to potentially maintain airway visualization uh, with it. And you have the ability to suction and irrigate at the same time. With the ION system, it uses fiber optic shape sensing. It's a completely new technology in, in terms of bronchoscopy itself. It has a 3.5 millimeter uh, fully articulating catheter, which you control uh, with the joystick and a scroll wheel, essentially. Uh, it fully articulates 180 degrees, like I mentioned. And it, but the biggest thing is they use shape sensing technology, uh, maintaining active control in the catheter position, and correcting unwanted deflection possibly as well. And I'll kind of go over a little bit more in detail about what shape sensing is. So obviously no system is perfect. There's going to be some limitations involving both systems. Uh, the Oris Monarch can be limited with electromagnetic navigation, you know, pacemakers, you know, fluoroscopy, any metal in the room, CR and cone beam. Uh, it is a larger bronchoscope, outer sheath, again, again, is six millimeters in size and can potentially limit, you know, when we start getting onto the seventh, eighth generations of the airway. And you don't get tactile feedback because it is a robotic system and it takes the bronchoscope out of our hands. The ion system, uh, you potentially could maintain, um, distance further out because it is a smaller catheter, but you don't have direct visualization like the Oris Monarch does. Uh, and again, there is no tactile feedback because again, there's no bronchoscope in your hand. You're controlling with the trackball system uh, itself. But there's other ways with the system itself that you can uh, suggest the drive force to help notice if there's any uh, damage to the airways or not. So with shape sensing, you know, I get asked this a lot. What is shape sensing itself? So within the catheter itself has all these uh, fiber optics that measures in real time if there is any changes to the shape of the catheter and continually um, collecting data for navigation purposes. So in clinical use, there was a technology developed by NASA, uh, but in clinical use, it, it tracks real time positioning and, um, throughout the entire catheter, uh, provides stability kind of measuring if there's causing any airway pressure, any deflection from the tip of the catheter and kind of uh, correcting itself. And one of the biggest things about this technology, it doesn't have any interference with metal, such as pacemakers, C-arm, cone beam, or any of those, because it doesn't use electromagnetic navigation. So it's completely separate from it. So kind of briefly, when I came to my hospital uh, in December, 2020, um, essentially there was no pathway on where pulmonary nodules would go. And I see that very commonly at a lot of institutions, you know, when patients get diagnosed with a pulmonary nodule incidentally, or via low dose screening, you know, primary care, you know, ERs, um, you know, and other physicians that see them and manage them really have no idea where they go. Uh, they can either go to pulmonary, some go to thoracic, some go to oncology without a biopsy, some go to IR, and they go all over the place. And one of my main goals at my institution is I wanted to create a streamlined approach on where these patients went. And robotic bronchoscopy kind of helps with that because it essentially will be a one-stop shop for in terms of diagnostics on what are my patients need. So anytime there's a nodule that gets found, either low-dose CT or incidentally uh, when they're getting a scan for something else, and there's a nodule that gets found, it essentially gets transferred to our lung nodule clinic. And from there, we would evaluate them if they need a bronchoscopy and with robotic bronchoscopy, since we're able to get out to the periphery with, you know, high diagnostic yields and low complication rate, it benefits the patient because we're creating a streamlined approach and not having patients go to, you know, multiple different specialties for diagnostics and, and eventually work up for their pulmonary nodule itself. 
kind of state of lung cancer, you know, one of the biggest things is obviously lung cancer is the highest um, mortality for in terms of all malignancies itself. You know, I, I remember the five year mortality average of all stages combined is around 20%. And we're kind of needing to improve that uh, to where potentially where breast cancer and prostate cancer are, you know, being in the 90s. So we got a lot of work that needs to be done. And one of the biggest thing is, you know, we have to have better diagnostics and that's kind of where robotic bronchoscopy is starting to come into place. But we also need to increase awareness for our patients who are high risk in terms of screening and then creating a streamlined approach. So there's no delay in treatment for our patients. And many of you may be aware that, you know, earlier this year, uh, the lung cancer screening guidelines have changed to incorporate much more patients that would qualify to getting a low dose CT scan, you know, changing the age from 50 to 80, uh, 20 pack your smoking history as well. So, you know, but the biggest downfall is we need to be able to screen more patients and that involves more education and also having a streamlined approach to a place where these patients would go if they have a nodule that gets found. So kind of briefly, you know, I like charts because you can visualize uh, where lung cancer kind of fails and we have to do a lot of work in terms of screening. You know, it's still less than 10% in the national lung cancer screening trials were done over 10 years ago and we still have a lot of work that needs to be done. So I think the more we're able to screen and the more cancers we find early on, you know, with robotic technology, we're able to diagnose them much sooner because we're able to uh, safely biopsy them and, and have a high yield compared to our previous um, modalities that we had. So prior to robotic bronchoscopy, many of you may be aware, you know, obviously we have the CT guided needle biopsies that usually gets performed by interventional radiology. They have a great yield, but they also have a high complication rate in terms of pneumothoraces. And there's some, some limitations. You can't biopsy bilateral lungs typically in a case you can't stage the mediastinum, uh, so they will need multiple procedures. And conventional bronchoscopy just wasn't great. You know, diagnostic yield, uh, you know, for the lesion size is less than two centimeters. You know, ha having a 50%, 60% uh, potential diagnostic rate is not great because these patients will eventually need more procedures. And electromagnetic navigation using SuperD and Varin, it's better than conventional bronchoscopy. Uh, especially with big lesions and over two centimeters. But if we really truly want to make a big difference and you know, uh, change the game for lung cancer, we got to be able to diagnose stuff much sooner and much smaller, you know, the sub-centimeter nodules that we need to regularly go after and diagnose them as early as possible. And that's where robotic bronchoscopy uh, comes into play. Building my program here, one of the first steps you have to do is you have to have a vision of where, what you want your program to be like. And when I first got here, you know, having robotic bronchoscopy being essentially the center of my program and convincing my executive team that we need this technology to better help our patients in terms of diagnostics, in terms of streamlining and having an approach that goes from step um, A to B as easy as possible. And the center of it is going to be robotic bronchoscopy itself. So educating and informing our referring physicians on what this technology can do, uh, in addition to our referring um, physicians, including oncology, thoracic surgery, radiation oncology, and even my own pulmonary group itself. So educating the community, obviously increasing awareness for low-dose CT, uh, not only increasing awareness, but if a nodule gets found, having a streamlined approach coming to the lung nodule clinic and they, they will get evaluated and anything that is considered six millimeters in a high risk patient, you know, we're able to safely do the biopsy with robotic bronchoscopy and using ion by an intuitive uh, at my institution, but also never saying no in terms of talking to other physicians, kind of building the program. Uh, Cause when I first got to my institution, you know, people had no idea what robotic bronchoscopy was. So this increasing awareness that this is some of the new technologies that we have, and this is the capabilities that uh, we're able to do with this technology. And essentially what the most difficult thing uh, that will take some time to change is basically changing old patterns. Cause like I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, when nodules get found, they would go all over the place in terms of, you know, where they get referred to, you know, some go to pulmonary, some go to thoracic surgery directly, some go to oncology, or even IR and then just change the culture to kind of come into a centralized location. And once the program is up and 
going, kind of maintaining awareness, kind of in a sense, you know, showing off what you're able to do, uh, what you're able to do with robotic bronchoscopy that you weren't able to do before, you know, showcasing that, hey, you know, we have this severe emphysematous patient that would have been, you know, a pneumothorax risk in terms of a CT guided biopsy that we're able to do it safely, you know, collecting data um, in terms for research or publication, or even for yourself to see if there's any areas for improvement that you need to have. And patient stories, marketing, and whatever you can do to increase awareness and just get the word out and spread your brand in a sense for your program. My impact for my practice, again, we we essentially started from scratch and kind of creating a lung nodule clinic, having a centralized location for all the referral bases to go to for any pulmonary nodule, uh, no matter what size. You know, it can be one millimeter in size that just needs follow-up and, and surveillance to something that's, you know, a three centimeter mass uh, that needs to urgent evaluation for a biopsy. So coming from low dose CT, primary care, thoracic surgery, pulmonary and radiation oncology and oncology itself. And with my thoracic surgeons, you know, the, when I got here and kind of started creating this lung nodule program, the whole idea is, you know, they're the ones that are going to, are going to do the surgery and I will be the one kind of doing the peripheral nodule biopsy. And we kind of have a, an approach in terms of, you know, if it's a biopsy that I do that's malignant, I would get them worked up. And so when they see the surgeon, you know, everything's ready for them to go and they get scheduled for surgery. So there's no delay in terms of workup or management. So essentially, that's kind of the goal when patients do come, you know, evaluate, risk assess all these patients. You know, if, if one of the nodules or lung masses that need to get biopsied, you know, get them uh schedule them for the procedure as quickly as possible. Essentially, my only contraindication for doing a robotic bronchoscopy is as long as they can tolerate anesthesia, we're going to actually, we're going to go ahead and do the biopsy itself. You know, how quickly can we get it done? You know, do they need a pet prior afterwards? And essentially when they go to treatment, everything will get done for my uh, specialist and with my thoracic surgeons, you know, my oncologist. And in some of those cases, we'll talk about tumor board uh, for those in between. And just kind of showing currently what's out there, you know, with as more and more data comes out, you'll kind of see like the diagnostic yield um, being on the left and on the bottom nodule size. We really need to start going after stuff that's less than two centimeters. And with ION and some of these robotic technologies that we're able to start doing that. Uh, and this slide clearly shows that, you know, we're actually uh, increasing our yield in terms of what we used to have with robotic technology. Now we're going after smaller and smaller stuff. And as we become more experienced, I think these numbers are just going to get better over time. Just kind of briefly going over my data. This is my three month uh, data after rough, roughly around 60 cases or so. And my diagnostic yield has been, um, pretty great so far. And I'm very fortunate to have um, great numbers because I'm able to help my patients out, you know, having a yield in the 90s so far. And so far in the first three months, I didn't have any pneumos yet. I did have one pneumo after my 75th case, um, but so far it's been safe, but compared to our CT guided, where my institution is roughly around 25% pneumo risk uh, for CT guided biopsy. So it's much safer for the patient. And we're getting yields that are better than our uh, CT guided biopsies at my institution itself. So it's better for the patients overall. And some brief pictures, some of these difficult locations that would have been hard to get with conventional bronchoscopy or even uh, some of the uh, other technology with, that use electromagnetic navigation. Uh, so this is a left upper lobe nodule, kind of a tight bend and having that curvature of robotic bronchoscopy and being able to get out to that periphery with ease and getting a diagnosis, uh, basically it's essentially it's a game changer in terms of peripheral nodules on how we manage them. Uh, difficult locations that, you know, when you've prior to robotic bronchoscopy, that would have been extremely difficult to get um, with either bronchoscopy or even CT guided biopsy, so such as this location. Uh, but being able to get there and biopsy something as small as five millimeters in size truly can make a huge difference for our patients, you know, being able to diagnose them as early as possible. You know, left upper lobe, um, patient was diagnosed uh, with this nodule on a low dose CT because they were smoking history and being able to diagnose something that was seven millimeters in size and safely get surgically removed and offering a cure for her. Um, and even some of the locations that would have been very difficult 
or not the easiest to get to, you know, having the robotic bronchoscopy and all these other tools in your hand, being able to get to those lesions. And this is a great case because obviously you can see a giant pacemaker um, and using ion that uses shape sensing, you don't have to worry about any distortion or any uh, deflection that is caused by your C-arm or, you know, pacemakers or anything like that like that, because it's a technology that's completely separate from it. Peru, thank you very much for taking us through your early experience and the great results that you've obtained. Um, I, I just want to uh, comment on one thing. And even though I said we wouldn't take questions, a comment isn't a question. So I, if I were you, I would continue to talk about the zero complication rate for as long as you can. Yeah. So in our program, I, uh, I talked about it. I actually bragged about it for, uh, for quite a while, but I will tell you the complication rate is not zero uh, if you do enough of them. So congratulations on the, on the good work until now. And uh, that's the spirit of the transparency that we're going to share with you tonight in this, in this forum. Uh, Vru, that was great. We're going to move on now to Dr. Bott. Uh, doc, Dr. Bott, please uh, tell us uh, your story from the thoracic surgeon side. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to um, my uh, colleagues on the panel here. Thanks to Chest uh, and to Intuitive for sponsoring the seminar. My name is Matthew Bott. I'm an assistant attending uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Center. I'm actually a thoracic surgeon. Um, so we deal obviously a lot with the diagnosis and treatment uh, of lung cancer. Uh, I was asked to talk specifically um, about data. So I'll go through some of the data that's in the literature. There's really not a ton of data. By, by no means, though, is the, toss, is the talk really meant to be completely comprehensive. I just sort of selected some what I think are uh, important uh, studies that uh, I'll mention as we go through. So um, the first study that I want to draw your attention to um, is the benefit study. Again, this is Dr. Patel mentioned there are two uh, robotic bronchoscopy platforms that are commercially available. Uh, this data comes from the um, uh, Monarch by uh, Oris uh, platform. This was uh, a safety and feasibility study uh, looking at 55 patients across five centers. They found that, um, first of all, let's look at what they were biopsying. So um, mean nodule size, about 23 millimeters. Um, predominantly upper lobe uh, lesions. And with those uh, characteristics, they were able to navigate to 96% of the lesions. Their pneumothorax rate, we were just talking about this, uh, was just under 4%. Uh, again, probably comparing favorably to a, a percutaneous uh, biopsy approach where you'd expect maybe a, a pneumothorax requiring a, a chest tube in 5 to 10% of cases. Now I'll say specifically that this study wasn't designed to assess yield. They do include yield as an exploratory analysis. Um, and they noted uh, a yield of around 74%, again, which I think compares uh, favorably with um, some of the uh, earlier uh, legacy technology like SuperDimension. This is a similar study. Um, a retrospective analysis of 167 lesions, again, using the Monarch platform. Uh, these procedures were performed at four centers within the U.S. Similar mean lesion size, about two and a half centimeters. Um, again, if you look, the majority have uh, uh, majority are peripheral, so two-thirds within the periphery of the lung. Almost 80% had a positive bronchus sign, about 80% with a concentric view on radial ebus. Uh, and you can see the size breakdown here. Again, navigation is very successful with these technologies. About almost 90% of cases uh, were able to be navigated successfully. Diagnostic yield in this study sort of depended on how they dealt with the uh, inflammatory lesions. So the follow-up in this study is only about six months at the time of publication anyway. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say sometimes whether those inflammatory lesions are indeed inflammatory uh, or whether there is underlying cancer that's just not detected uh, on the biopsy. Nonetheless, uh, depending on how they define that, the diagnostic yield ranged from about 69% to 77%, uh, whether they considered those inflammatory lesions diagnostic or not. Uh, 
Very similar rate in pneumothorax, 3.6% in this case, and uh, several cases had uh, did have bleeding episodes, but fortunately those were fairly uh, unusual. So I'll get into some data from the ION platform. Um, this is the data from the first, uh, first in human safety and feasibility study it was published in 2019. These were right around 30 patients, a mean lesion diameter in this case of about 12 millimeters. Procedures took on average about an hour. The primary endpoint here, once again, is safety and feasibility. And the target uh, was reached in about 96.6% of cases. They note that in the first case, uh, they were not able to navigate to the target and they felt like this was mostly due to uh, operator inexperience. Obviously it was, a, was the first case. Uh, but in those 30 cases, no pneumothorax uh, or bleeding. And again, although the study is really not designed to look at diagnostic yield, they noted a diagnostic yield overall of about 79%. And if you look specifically at those cases uh, that involve cancer, the yield was about 88%. I'll mention that there is a multi-center uh, prospective study in progress. To my knowledge, this uh, study has, is still enrolling, still open. Uh, but there was data presented in abstract form, at least um, from a, a meeting in 2020. So based on the data that was presented at that meeting, the uh, mean lesion diameter was about 18 millimeters. So again, these are relatively small lesions, again, primarily uh, upper lobe lesions. Procedure time in this case, just over 45 minutes. Um, they traversed about six or seven generations out into the airway tree in order to perform these biopsies. And over half of these lesions were located within one centimeter of the pleura. So again, uh, fairly, fairly peripheral and potentially challenging targets with uh, previous versions of this technology. So they were able to navigate within two centimeters of the lesion and complete a biopsy in 98% of cases. They did not see any complications. And again, they say that they uh, plan to report the yield and sensitivity data uh, at a later time point once the study is completed. So I'd like to just talk for a few minutes about our experience here at uh, MSK. Our data was recently accepted by CHEST and is available online if anyone wants to review the manuscript early. Um, again, a retrospective review of our prospective database. So when we uh, initiated our program in October of 2019, we felt it was very important uh, to create a companion database so that we can perform research projects like this and really assess the utility of the, of the technology. So this was a study of the first 159 lesions, essentially all lesions that had 12 month follow-up um, at the time of analysis. The devil is always in the details with these studies. So I encourage you to read them carefully and think about how things are classified. Uh, we considered malignant anything that was frankly a uh, cancer, uh, as well as anything deemed suspicious by the pathologist because that indicates uh, a relative level of confidence on their part. Non-diagnostic were either failed procedures, ones where we didn't get tissue, or cells that were deemed atypical, again, sort of failing to meet this bar of, of adequacy on behalf of the uh, reviewing pathologist. And then non-malignant um, yet diagnostic etiologies were things that were inflammatory, infectious, et cetera. Once again, uh, how you sort of characterize those non-malignant lesions uh, is really critical in terms of diagnostic versus non-diagnostic. So we use this uh, algorithm and essentially we would follow all these lesions for a year. If, if inflammatory lesions regress, we say that the procedure is, is diagnostic. If they progress, obviously that's more concerning for cancer and those are deemed non-diagnostic. If at a year, uh, those uh, lesions are stable, then the, then the uh, procedure is deemed diagnostic. If they don't have one year follow-up for some reason, I think there was rel relatively few in this study, those are deemed uh, non-diagnostic. Uh, similarly, if there was a confirmatory biopsy performed that showed that the lesions were indeed cancerous, then obviously the procedure is non-diagnostic, whereas if there was another um, uh, diagnosis that was identified, granuloma, et cetera, um, then those were uh, considered diagnostic. Our median lesion size was 1.8 centimeters in line, I think, with uh, other studies. You can see the histogram of lesion size here. Uh, about uh, just over a third were in the outer third of the lung. About two-thirds did have a bronchus sign, predominantly solid lesions. 
And again, uh, mostly located in the upper lobes of the lung. We use radial EBUS in the vast majority of these cases. Uh, uh, partway into the uh, study period, we did acquire a Siemens uh, Cyospin 3D fluoroscopy unit, and that was used in about 20% uh, of the cases included in this data set. About half of the lesions had a concentric view on EBUS, uh, about uh, just over a third were eccentric, and about 10% had no view. We do a needle biopsy in just about every case, uh, and a forcep biopsy accompanied that in about a third of the cases as well. So our overall yield in this study uh, is around 82%, which again, I think compares favorably considering the difficulty of these lesions uh, relative to some of the older technology um, that has been published previously. Of the non-diagnostic lesions, about half of those were ultimately found to be cancerous. Um, two, based on increase in size. Um, and then uh, about uh, three patients, 10% of the cohort were deemed non-diagnostic because they had insufficient uh, follow-up. We found in our analysis that uh, Accuracy of the biopsy was highly dependent on the size of the lesion, which you can imagine. So interestingly, for lesions that were two centimeters or greater, our uh, accuracy was at least 90%, and for larger lesions, uh, 100%. Um, for one to two centimeters, we were in about a 70% range, and for less than, for sub-centimeter lesions, we were about two-thirds accurate in about two-thirds of cases. Um, again, multivariate analysis showed that lesion size was predictive of a successful procedure. There were other predictors in a, a univariate model, but nothing that reached significance uh, in the multivariate model. Safety is obviously critically important in these procedures. Overall, the uh, event rate was very low, about 3%. We had two pneumothoraces, uh, both requiring a uh, tube thoracostomy for an overall pneumothorax rate of 1.5%, which again, I think is still very favorable, favorable comparing what's in the literature with um, percutaneous biopsy. We had one patient that had uh, hypoxia after surgery and just required overnight observation was discharged uneventfully the following day. And one patient that had an aspiration pneumonia related to uh, anesthesia induction and also required observation, but recovered uh, uneventfully. So I think one of the things that we as uh, that I get asked quite a bit as a surgeon is, you know, what's the what's the utility of surgeons acquiring this technology and these skills? And I think there are a number of things that I would say uh, at Sloan Kettering. Thoracic surgeons are often the intake point for undiagnosed pulmonary nodules. So it's in our interest to really um, be uh, efficient uh, and capable of, of working these up. I think, you know, if, if surgeons are indeed uh, facile with this technology, it really allows for the centralization of diagnosis, staging, and treatment of early stage lung cancer. And surgeons sort of become this one-stop shop and, and can walk the patient through every step of that process. And I think this presents at least potential benefits in terms of efficiency of care uh, and time to treatment. Uh, there, there will be, there are, and there will be uh, existing applications beyond biopsy. So I'm gonna show you a case in a second that involves dye marking of a small nodule. Uh, Dr. Ross brought up the possibility of single anesthetic procedures. So can you do diagno diagnosis and treatment all in a, in a single anesthetic? I think that's certainly a uh, possible with the technology as it stands right now. And then future applications like ablation and other things that I think we're all very interested in, you know, having all of those, um, all of those techniques and tools at our disposal really allows the surgeon to, to sort of um, determine and tailor the, the treatment based on the, the needs of the patient and, the, and their operability. So this is a quick case. This is a 57-year-old never smoker who was found to have a three-centimeter lung nodule. She had a PET scan showing um, contralateral mediastinal lymphadenopathy and an outside EBUS confirmed uh, disease in those contralateral nodes. So she was staged as a 3B. However, on closer inspection of her CT scan, she did have several additional small nodules as well as interstitial thickening in the right lung that was felt to be suspicious for lymphangitic carcinomatosis uh, and uh, intrapulmonary metastasis by the radiologist. 
So we made the decision to pursue a diagnostic wedge resection to uh, determine whether the patient should be a candidate for radiotherapy if she was indeed stage 3B rather than stage 4. Rather than take blind biopsies of the um, interstitial thickening in the lower lobe, we decided to be a little more targeted in our approach and mark these middle lobe lesions um, for resection. This is the plan from the case. You see, you can see that it was relatively, it was a relatively sh a straight shot out of what in the segmental bronchi within the middle lobe. Uh, again, we did this case with the intraoperative uh, 3D fluoroscopy. You can see the catheter in the area of the lesion, and then we deployed the needle, so it was immediately subpleural. I injected a combinate one-to-one -one combination of methylene blue and ICG, so that we could visualize the lesion both with. Um, um, uh, light thoracoscopy, as well as um, um, in, uh, pinpoint imaging with a pinpoint camera. And the lesion was clearly visible. We performed a wedge resection of that area, uh, and it indeed contained a small focus of metastatic adenocarcinoma, and the patient went on to receive systemic therapy. So with that, I'll stop and we'll um, proceed to a question and answer session. But I did want to acknowledge uh, all of my colleagues, both in thoracic surgery as well as interventional pulmonology. As I mentioned, this is a very much a uh, collaborative effort. And I think it uh, speaks really to the uh, collegiality of our team, both in a clinical and an academic sense. Um, I'd like to thank our data managers who contributed to the data I showed you, our pathologists that work very closely with us, uh, as well as several folks within our epidemiom epidemiology and biostatistics department. So thank you very much. Matt, that was a great talk. Thank you for sharing your outstanding results on this. Uh, we're off to a, a good start for the evening. So questions are, are beginning to uh, file in. So the first question and going this send both of you jump in on this. I think you did a very nice, uh, a nice introduction to when is a lesion truly benign and when is a biopsy not just non-diagnostic. So if, if the two of you could talk about your very practical solution to what happens when you don't get enough and what you use to, um, to change the pattern of how you care for that patient. Sure, I, I can start, I guess. So um, I think the, the sort of algorithm from there really depends on your level of suspicion. So if you have a highly suspicious lesion and a non-diagnostic biopsy, then I'm always you know, inclined to pursue another modality. And usually that's percutaneous biopsy. If that's you know, consistent with an inflammatory lesion, uh, then I feel pretty comfortable watching from there. Um, if the lesion isn't amenable to percutaneous biopsy and, you know, it's maybe intermediate um, suspicion, then I typically would watch and, you know, if it remains stable, um, continue to observe. And if it enlarges and consider surgical resection as sort of the ultimate diagnostic modality. Um, but uh, I think there are difficult situations. You see something on the path that says, you know, atypical or, or something that is a little suspicious, but the pathologist can't quite put their finger on whether it's cancerous or not. Those are, those right. are always difficult situations. And I think just the workup from there varies, you know, from patient to patient and, and what the scenario is. Uh, Drew, how do you approach this? Yeah, I completely agree, uh, Dr. Ba. I think these potential benign lesions are difficult. And I think a lot of it's depending on pretest probability is, do you think there's a high risk of this patient having malignancy in terms of, are they you know, a big smoker or whatnot. Um, but other things we kind of incorporate, we incorporate um, using other serum risk test assessment um, test because of their high negative predictive value. So we kind of use those in conjunction with our biopsies. So the one specific that we use is the biodesic notify test. So we use it in conjunction. We don't use it as a diagnostic modality. We just kind of use it uh, with our biopsy. So if we have a high um, pretest you know, probability of this being a benign lesion and the serum test comes back that's most likely going to be low yield for malignancy, it kind of makes me feel more comfortable that, you know, what I got during the case being benign is going to be benign. We won't ignore it or still follow it. Um, but yeah, those situations can be difficult 
especially if your pretest probability is high, you know, we'll definitely pursue other modalities, you know, either, either CT get it or just um, have my surgeons remove it itself. So. Well, that, no, that's a good answer. So that's actually the, the next question is how has this technology changed your approach to the completely suspicious nodule? So we've been all in this business for a long time, speculated nodule in a smoker that in the past, uh, Matt, you might have said, I'm just going to take that out. Or Vru, you might have said, I'm just sending this one straight to thoracic surgery. Do you now have a biopsy on every patient before they go to the operating room? So at my institution, uh, we'll typically we'll get a biopsy and prove it. Um, living in Indiana, we have a high probability of you know, having granulomas, uh, histoplasmosis. So yeah, you will see a lot of these nodules that even in a high risk patient that look speculated, you know, may act like cancer, smell like cancer, but end up being a granuloma. And we don't want these patients to having their lung removed for benign issues. Um, we want to avoid that granulectomy uh, type procedure. So I think we have an understanding with our thoracic surgeons. I hate, we're going to get a biopsy. We're going to prove it. So when we send it to you, you're not going to just remove, you know, a benign nodule. And that just makes, I'm sure it makes them feel bad. It's like, you know, we just removed a lung for a benign process. Um, so I think the process at our institution is get a biopsy proven and remove the, get a lobectomy or a wedge and have to take it out. Matt, what do you think? I think my, my practice is a little different. I would say that I don't always uh, get a biopsy before we proceed to resection. If I have a highly suspicious lesion in a healthy patient who's low risk for surgery and it's amenable to a, wedge, a diagnostic wedge resection to start, I have no problem taking that patient right to surgery. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm always hesitant to do anatomic uh, resections, i.e. lobectomy in the absence of a diagnosis. So I'm, I'm pretty much a stickler for having a tissue diagnosis before we proceed with that type of intervention. But I do think there is a population of patients who are, you know, if the, if the lesion's amenable to wedge and it looks suspicious and it's a low risk procedure, then I have no problem going right to resection. All right, good. All right, here's another question. Uh, now that this technology is available and it sort of is a little bit of what we just started to discuss, does every nodule, even the five millimeter, does every nodule now need to be biopsy? Does everyone need an ion procedure? That's a hard question. Um, you know, I, and that, I think that's part of the, not the problem with screening, but the caveat to screening is that we find so many little tiny nodules, right? And then we don't know what to do. And, you know, whether it's solid or maybe even in particular ground glass lesions, right? If, if we all see these sort of very slowly progressive ground glass lesions that enlarge a millimeter, two millimeters a year, and they have a little maybe punctate solid component and there's no sort of clear trigger when to, when to intervene on these people or not. I think that's really difficult. And I, I think, you know, in my own practice, you know, I, I think if I had to sort of throw out a, a, a size where I sort of think about doing something, maybe more so than not, maybe, you know, if I see things creep up into that eight millimeter, a centimeter sort of range, then maybe I'm a little more proactive. Whereas five <coughs> millimeters, I, I just sort of watch for a while but again, uh, I think we, we need maybe in the era of screening, maybe we need to sort of, we need to firm up uh, guidelines for intervening on some of these things, which I think we're going to find more and more routinely. But. No, absolutely. I agree. Uh, I don't think every single five, six millimeter nodule needs to get a biopsy or a robotic procedure. I think definitely in the high risk category, you know, if you have a smoker who's had 30 plus pack years and get a low dose screening CT and have a speculated six millimeter nodule. Uh, obviously the PET scan is not going to really help much since it's less than an eight millimeter cutoff. You know, I would probably be more aggressive in doing biopsies of those. If we find incidental nodules for somebody going in for chest pain and they have a, you know, five millimeter nodule, I'd probably just watch that. So it kind of depends on how the patient is coming to you. Um, my philosophy is, you know, if it's getting a, a low dose CT that we're actually looking for early signs of lung cancer in, in a high risk smoker, and we find something, you know, five, six millimeters, I may be more aggressive and inclined to doing a biopsy on those. But on the flip side of it, if we get referrals for, you know, 
chest pain, CTAs, or any other CT scan that finds interdental stuff, we'll probably just watch those. So it kind of depends on how the patient and the clinical uh, scenario for them. All right, great. So we have a question from uh, one of our thoracic surgery colleagues, uh, a good friend. With the opportunity to obtain subtype determination, i.e. lipidic versus micropapillary, change the approach with robotic bronch to the suspicious approach to, of, to the suspicious pulmonary nodule. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say that um, I think that is one of the uh, strengths of the platform is the opportunity to do forcep biopsies where you can gain uh, histologic information similar to a core. And uh, our pathologists report that out pretty routinely, and I think it is helpful. You know, I, I think the information is really meaningful if you're going to tailor, let's say, the extent of your resection based on histology, right? If you have a, a lipidic or acinar lesion and you feel like you can do a wedge or a segmentectomy, whereas, you know, if you have a solid, most primarily solid or micropapular lesion and you really lean more toward doing a lobectomy, something like that, I could see that that information in that scenario being really helpful. Um, you know, I, I don't know in my practice that it's changed my approach to what I biopsy or not, or or even the sort of downstream treatment aspects of it. But I could certainly see uh, folks sort of in, incorporating that into their decision making based on the ability to do those things. Yeah, I think with robotic bronchoscopy, obviously you're able to use a lot more diagnostic tools, uh, forceps, needles, um, brushes. I personally use the 1.1 millimeter cryoprobe with our ion to get bigger pieces. Uh, so obviously, you know, having robotic bronchoscopy be able to essentially park the bronchoscope uh, next to lesion, not have to worry about moving it, not have to worry about your shoulder, arm getting tired, and just having it in place and just collecting as many samples. So I think that um, offers the opportunity of, you know, using more tools, getting more tissue and kind of determining what needs to be done from there. Great. Great. All right. We have another question. How has the availability of this technology changed your approach to nodules in patients with other solid tumors? Or do you want to start? Yeah, I guess so then. So I think, you know, obviously as we're kind of developing a more comprehensive oncology program, you know, we always want to rule out those single metastatic lesions. Uh, so, you know, we primarily deal with lung cancer, but I think the approach is, you know, we're trying to build this program for, you know, having cancers of the chest. So it's not just lung cancer. It could be metastatic lesions from breast or some other site that being able to diagnose these uh, obviously will change their treatment plan. Do they need a, you know, single wedge to remove a metastatic lesion? Do they need radiation? Do they need, you know, more systemic therapy? So obviously it offers us more opportunities to um, be able to get a diagnosis for these patients with this technology uh, and be more aggressive with them as well in, in their treatment plans. And I think that I'll say a couple of things. One, I think that um, the ability to biopsy multiple lesions in a single procedure is really helpful. And especially, you know, I think as we're starting to consider more and more this idea of oligometastatic disease and, and starting to treat some of those patients with more local therapy, you know, the status of each lesion becomes important. You know, it's not just biopsying one saying, oh, it's metastasis, and then the patient gets systemic therapy. Now we try and, you know, be a little um, maybe more complicated in terms of how we approach those, those patients. So there, there is an advantage to the technology there. Bilateral lesions, same thing, right? Not normally a situation that you would um, approach with a percutaneous biopsy in a single procedure, at least at most places. Um, and the second thing I think sort of ties into your original point about you know, what does this technology bring to uh, an oncology program as a whole? It's not just about lung cancer, right? We can facilitate the, the treatment of all sorts of, of patients, irrespective of whether they have lung cancer or not. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a great way to, to, first of all, help those patients, but also to establish relationships with, with physicians, medical oncologists, whatnot, who treat other diseases that you may not necessarily uh, have contact with uh, otherwise. So I think it's very, very helpful. All right, here we have a question on staging. So 
you're doing an eye on and you're planning to move ahead to resection, uh, do you always do an EBUS on those patients? True. So my philosophy is if I'm going to do a robotic bronchoscopy under anesthesia, I'm going to do the EBUS uh, for all my patients, no matter the size or the characteristics of the lesion. Because if they're already under anesthesia, then I can always do my cases. My general case time for my robot plus staging the mediastinum is roughly about an hour. Um, so it doesn't add you know, too much additional time to the case, but I think it's worthwhile because uh, we're trying to be a one-stop shop for these patients and preventing them from getting multiple procedures. So if they're already under, I'm going to do the EBUS. I'll say that I'm, I might be a little more selective, but I still have a pretty low threshold to do a staging procedure if the patient's already asleep and it, you know, it adds another 20 minutes to the case, whatever it is. You know, again, I, I sort of stick to this, like, you know, if the tumor is three centimeters central, all those things increase my likelihood to do it. Um, if there's any suggestion of node activity on the PET scan, I have a low threshold for doing it. Uh, or even, you know, a, a patient that um, where I feel like the tumor is high risk for nodal spread or somebody who I think I'm going to send for stereotactic radiation, I really want to make sure they don't have nodal disease. Uh, I might do that even in a, you know, a, a centimeter and a half, two centimeter lesion, uh, just to make sure that the treatment is appropriate. So great, great. I think that these are these questions really uh, reflect the clinical challenges which all of us face on a daily basis and how each of us and each of our programs is going to leverage this technology to its maximum advantage is something that we're going to be sharing back and forth over, over the next uh, few months and years. So, well, this has been a, a wonderful evening. I'm, I'm checking the, uh, the Q and a, so it, this is a last call to anyone who has been shy about typing in the question. Uh, we want to be able to answer any concerns or interests that you may have. Um, I will take a moment while we're waiting for those questions to come in to thank our society, thank CHEST for, for putting this together. And in, in addition, I want to thank our industry sponsor, Intuitive, for having the, uh, uh, the ability to provide this platform for CHEST to have these educational venues, especially about the early diagnosis of lung cancer, something about which we're all passionate. Looking at the questions. <clears throat> The uh, As you know, we have a meeting coming up here, and I think it's only three weeks, right, when coming up. Although CHEST is not in Florida and has gone virtual, I hope that we are going to see many of you connected on Zoom through this. Uh, there will be projects that are shown on robotic bronchoscopy and early diagnosis. So if you're interested in this topic, please follow up at the CHEST meeting. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in that virtual forum and I know all of us are longing for the fact that we can soon get back together in person. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, Carla, for helping coordinate this program. And to my presenters, uh, Matt and Drew, yeah, your, uh, your work is outstanding. You're doing a great job moving this technology forward. And I think that all of your patients truly benefit from the, what you're able to provide. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.